nice to kind of be, people share their experiences yeah, as well because we've be got good. another half an hour, yeah. Hi, thank Hi. you so much. Um, uh, my name is Emma and I'm a, a writer and an activist and I work with an art strategy called Invisible Dust. We work with artists and, and scientists to make public artworks about climate change. And I wanted to ask you two questions, um, mainly um, to you, Tina, but to, you can all feed in. Um, one is about sustainability in terms of s your sustainability, I guess. As you said, it's, it's been a very long time. Yeah. It's going to be a very long time. It's yeah. going to be a, a long, an ongoing struggle. And I think the, the, the fact about time is, is really relevant and helpful. But can you talk a little bit about how you've managed to, how different members have managed to keep going? Can I first of all talk to your subject, art? Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> this is just fantastic. What we do, so in the beginning, okay, this is when we had the first clash with like carbine activism, was we tie little ribbons in the fences and the hedges because it's an ugly place and it gave us something to be focused on and it gave some beauty. <coughs> they started tearing them down every night. And every day we put them up and every night they tear them down. And some of the artwork that's come out, there's like ribbons now on the fencing that are the planet. You know, originally we were just tying and they look like um, Tibetan prayer flags just flying in the wind. But every time they take them down, we get delivered so much fabric, it's ludicrous. <laughs> because people we photograph at the end of the day, look what we did, and then the next morning it's all down, then people send more fabric, mm. and then we just spend all the time doing it, and it makes it very beautiful. And the art really enriches us, and it gives us a focus. One of the security guards said to me the other day, I'm just going to take all that down at the end of the day, team. That was really cold. My fingers were freezing. I said, yeah, I said, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You're going to take them down after 6 o'clock. It's got to be really cold <laughs> then. I said, for two hours of your life, I dictate your job title. I said, chief ribbon untie. Take that home to your wife and tell her what a great job she did. <laughs> so, um, as for the toll on us, I always think that, you know, we all know Dora the Explorer, the little kid's cartoon, and, and when she's low on energy, she, she puts things in her rucksack, doesn't she? So, for me, I have, like, Elle in my rucksack and Maureen in my rucksack in the sense that along the way and the woman the 90 year old lady who makes the cakes is that you pick up the things that gave you joy or lifted your spirit or made you aware that so many other people were fighting that that gives you energy but then i'm back to the point that even if i was so exhausted i could drop what can i do i have her how can i walk away at what point can you have a day off and go bugger it it doesn't matter because it does it's her water her air and her future and her ability to have children more than that though and fighting so that she doesn't have to have the fight as well. Because this fight with a government, how dare it? It's that realisation that they were willing to play Russian roulette with our children. That they weighed up an economy and a woman's ability to have children or living children. And they weighed those things up and they said, you know what? Ah, it's worth the risk. It is not worth the risk. Mm. And there are 670 peer-reviewed studies that tell them, 80% of which, it is not worth the risk. And yet they still take it with our children. And so you realise that what I'm defending for her isn't just her air and water. It's the, what else are they going to throw at her? And why should she grow up having to have that fight all her life? Can I, um, have you, sorry, Emma, have you? Yeah. Um, I, can I just, I, I, the other question I wanted to ask was about solidarity and about um, what work you do with other, other movements. Oh, amazing. We've got the Knitting Nanas in Australia, we're the Nanas <coughs> of Lancashire, and then there's the Indigenous Grandmothers at Standing Rock. And there's the, I mean, the solidarity, particularly amongst the women, is amazing, and we all share well. Um, but, but every group, I mean, we had the Bentley Boys come out, three men from Australia who came out and toured a film for us. And we paid for, uh, we've all got together as groups and shared our money so that we could pay for, like, experts to come out and talk to us. The solidarity within our own, own country is astounding, <coughs> but with other countries. And I always say they're like the ghosts of Christmas future. They come, they tell us, this is life in a gas field, this is what happens. And so there's no excuse for us to say we didn't know, because we do know. We know clearly what's going to happen if this continues. Thank yes, you. thank you. Yeah, so um, you know me. So I do. This is Andrew. <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, and and um, I suppose there's a reason for everything. And, you know, inadvertently I was excluded from making a point this morning. And what, what I wanted to say is, as a parent myself, and actually living in the neighbourhood where two boys were recently murdered, um, the kids are getting this message that they haven't got a future all the time. They haven't got a future, they haven't got a job, they can't buy a house, blah, 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 blah. it just goes on and yeah. on and on and on. And I know from my previous, well, 
current work in drug policy reform that you know all of these things are not unconnected. Yeah. In other countries, you know, the aerial fumigation of frigging you know opium, coca, blah 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 blah, is destroying the land as well. Yeah. So one of my girlfriends in Colombia is actually completely rejected her little NGO, which was all about coca, but the law in coca, to look at aerial, you know, um, agrarian revolution, That's nice. basically. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the FARC controlled the land, yes. and then there was all this death, and blah, 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 blah. But what I do with Millie, who's my 10-year-old daughter, is, I mean, you know, my obsession is, I may not be here, because I'm, you know, not well myself, and she's, you know, growing fast, and I'm 57 already, is I get obsessed about what her future will be in terms of work, right? So we don't laugh, but that's what happened. And, <laughs> and you know, like, when I hear at these conferences about, you know, the million jobs for climate change. That's my sort of, you know, that try and focus for her. The hope. The yeah. hope, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because of course she's been at Occupy and yeah. anti-fracking, uh, you know, so she, you know, she's 10 now and she's like, oh, you know, nice CC bags, you know, fake, what do you call it? Who's that? Calvin Klein. I mean, like, you know, I can't, you, you would laugh. You know, it's really difficult to get her to come to stuff. But, you know, she has got a future, as you keep yeah. alluding to. Our children have futures. And so I feel that it's really, you know, we, that hope is critical. Yeah. You know, because those boys that got killed, they, they must have. And we know, you know, in fact, her cousin, <coughs> immediately we went around to have a chat about it a few days after the murders. And that was immediately what came up. Her cousin, yeah. Annie... We got no hope. We're told we haven't got houses. We haven't got this, that, and the other. Why wouldn't we fucking kill each other? And I was like, what? Yeah. You know. And so that's where I go with it. I think there is such useful. a huge despondency, and I think it's really sad because kids are exposed to it. But then I, I suppose all we can do is is keep. I mean, I actually I'm not pessimistic. I'm actually really optimistic. Mm, I do exactly. believe that I watch the way our kids communicate, and I watch the way Amelia communicates with people online. She hasn't actually asked what religion, colour, and none of that stuff, because they're just talking in emojis or something like that, the same language. <laughs> we smile at the same thing. They share, you can share a video clip and smile in the same language, you know. Um, but also I think because kids have access to far more information, yes, it's overwhelming, but then these solutions are there. So yes. I ask Amelia to look into things like, oh, you know, look at this person in history and look at these things that matter. And, and I think that it's a generation that has access to information, has access to each other at a level that we never had before. I mean, I think back only a couple of decades ago, I'd watch BBC Question Time and think I was the only person that was angry with the government because I couldn't see anybody else being angry with the government. Then along came Twitter. And <laughs> a thousand people would be going, Jesus Christ, nobody happy with it. So you, you get that reinforced, but also the access to people. I think even Barry Gardner said it this morning, I was glad he said it, because I don't consider them to be in power. They're in office. They should be in a bloody office, but mm. that would help. Uh, rather than a place of privilege. And I think that our younger generation, and I certainly watch them in the movement, and I am so optimistic that our younger generation, we think of you and Callum and everybody else, I mean, your generation is well-informed, able angry. and equipped and angry, but angry yeah. and doing something about it, not mm -hmm. angry and just sitting there being angry and futile. Can I, can I caution on that? Is that in what I've discovered, and I think we discovered particularly around the Trump election and Brexit, is that you... You, what you see on your feed is what you want to see. I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And there's an awful lot of people out there who, you know, whether it's Calvin Klein or whatever next fad it is, or yeah. next computer mm -hmm. game or whatever's online, don't care. Yeah. <laughs> or, it's yeah. worse, well, don't, you know, are pushing you against, and you don't yeah. see that. And I think it's keeping aware that, yes, yeah. you could. But actually, sometimes you have to step into their world. You have to, as you you know, you... you, you, you and it's different skills and different. It's, it's the yeah. say Christian aid. Same earlier. We often have older people. We have pillars of the community that will talk about these things for yeah. us. We have church and faith leaders who are a bit unusual. You know, it's finding the unusual suspects yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, because you can become too comforted in, in your, Absolutely. In your um, totally agree in, in your bubble. So I would, I would caution a little. Yeah. To uh, to get too comfortable. Oh, I, no, I, 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 I think I think too. last year I was in, in twenty sixteen showed us that if nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, yes. <laughs> well, first to say, two inspirational speakers. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic this afternoon. I'll certainly go home a lot more enthusiastic and cheery tonight than <laughs> when I left the house at quarter past five this morning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But actually, I was in this one particularly for you. You, you talked about, um, you know, really fascinating examples of the work that you've done and the importance of having women at the heart of this, so they're part of the, you know, developing the solution. We've got the kind of cultural and educational issues that you have, this, those sort of areas. Well, what does that look like in reality? We've got a couple of examples of where and when you've been able to make women part of that solution. What, what that's yeah, been. it's one of the ones I didn't have time for, in my, which I think is absolutely fantastic one, which is, is a, a, a group called the Barefoot College in India. Uh, and they decided that they would try and promote um, solar panels for, for households, sort of home systems, uh, again in remote parts of, of India, uh, um, particularly in the hilly areas, so which are you know, never going to get electric grid uh, there. And their initial, this isn't specifically a Christian aid example, it's one I've, I've experienced over time, but um, initially they trained uh, youth, young boys, to, to manage, you have to repair, replace, replace batteries, keep, you know, set up in the first place, go out and promote. And they, they, they trained young men uh, who learned wonderful skills and went off to the city uh, and didn't stay in the local area. Mm. So what they now do is bring in sometimes older women from the, even at, you know, often illiterate, uh, bring them in, train them, um, give them the sort of starter pack and, and, and they go off. And, and, and it's those women who are set in the community, part of the community, who train <laughs> other women. Uh, to do the same yeah. in, that, in that community so, so that you can set up your solar systems but you can keep them and maintain them so it's actually, in that, I mean that's a real positive mm -hmm. uh, example of, of turning that around um, so I think that, I think there are, uh, there's still too few <laughs> um, I mean there, it, it's interesting um, we talk a lot about the green economy how do we create this green economy and um, I was at the, the last Earth Summit and we 2012, this is a while ago, but um, I remember going with this green economy message and we can all sort of turn it from a brown and dirty economy into a green economy and it was actually some Bolivians came up and it was men and women and said, oh, we don't like the green economy. And it, what they didn't like was the word economy because that meant you could buy and sell their resources and they had resources they had been in for years and you know, were, were theirs by right, not, by, not because they had a legal bit of paper in their hands. Um, and it was this idea, yes, you could buy and sell, and actually some of the green solutions that have come out have been about protecting a forest, and you know, mm -hmm. therefore people are not allowed to, you hear some just completely perverse, the sustainably managed forests that are, are, are being, being, or it, it's interesting, we've had some resistance in Kenya, for example, to um, wind turbines and solar farms, I mean, you think NIMBY in this country people don't like the solar fields, but actually they're taking land off people who had previously used it and roamed it or, you know, used it sustainably before, so that, again, there was no engagement with the local people in that. So there's this pushback, so we're now having to really very much live up the, the appropriate sustainable solutions rather than just the renewable to renewables, renewables there. So there, as I say, there's not enough, not enough examples, and that's why we have to keep raising it, but I think... Um, that there are examples that we need to, to shout about, and, and often it's um, it actually in Kenya with the smaller scale electricity, it's women's enterprise. We set up little solar mm -hmm. shops that are often women run uh, mm -hmm. as well. I heard about something other. I think the Solar Century did, <coughs> and they exchanged um, kerosene for solar, um, and but the impact of that was beyond anything they imagined because this simple change meant that the children were studying later into yeah. the evening because the, oh, it lasted longer, so the education improved. The money they saved from buying kerosene meant everyone was healthier because they were spending it on food. And, and it was just like this knock-on effect. Well, no, 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 I mean, it's even great. I, mean, I, remember, I do remember when I used to go out and, and help teams in different countries. I remember going to Zimbabwe to a microhydro site there and talking to you know, the women and people. And, and there was a clinic that was there. I mean, it was this very classic sort of case. And I went and talked to the... The lady in the clinic there, the first time electricity the year before, and she I said, well, what's the difference? And she said, well, women no longer give birth by candlelight. Wow. <laughs> so it, it really is. Um, yeah. And you talk about you and your children in the fracking area. Yeah. The, the other thing I, I did when I was at Practical Action, which is a very practical organisation <laughs> in doing these things, was um, work with people in uh, again in Kenya and then in Nepal. Because um, two and a half billion people... Uh, cook on an open fire, on a bonfire, on a barbecue. Two and a half billion people, uh, more than a third, almost a half of people around the world, cook every single meal, heat up their water on an open fire. 
Most of that is done indoors because you have your kitchen indoors, you don't have it outdoors for people to steal your food or, you know, for lots of cultural reasons, which means they're breathing in uh, emissions. The levels of emissions, we actually measured the levels and it's disgusting. So if you can replace that and the kerosene in the yeah. house with a or either a much more efficient wood stove that takes yeah. the smoke out or with something that's you know, solar cooker or... Um, the, the, the death rate, I mean literally death rate, is one of the biggest causes of child death is smoke in households. Wow. I mean, it, or it is, it's, it's, it's it, it, four, 4 million people, you put AIDS, TB and a number of other illnesses together and indoor air pollution kills more. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'm going a bit of a rant here, yeah. but, it's, it's, but, you're a bit, but who knew? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But it, it, so you know, these are billions of people who have got no other option but to cook in this filthy thing, whose children and their own health is at risk yeah. from what they're doing every single day. So switching that technology can absolutely dramatic. And again, once you tell these women, this is what's causing the coughs, this is what's causing the eye problems, um, they can't not. Yes. <laughs> they once you say you can't, it, no, yeah. you know. So it, that's when you said that. Yeah. That was exactly what happened in the group in Nepal. They showed them the statistics and explained them and, and said, "This is what's happening in your house." And she was like, "Right, everybody." <laughs> yeah. Wait, now we know. We'll yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So they're not. But does that not give you hope then? Because I think that the, the the only problem ever in the world is a communication problem. You just don't have the truth or the information that you need no. to solve the thing. But, but what you described there is that the women very quickly uptaking on like, oh, well, if that's all it is, then we'll do that. So maybe some of the things that we think will take a long, long time, maybe we'll pick them up a lot quicker. And I think when you think we've had the vote for just over 100 years, <coughs> and even then only some of us had the vote back then, I think women have come along, particularly you know, the ones in this country, in, in an amazing speed. And we haven't even begun to have an impact yet. And you're working in places perhaps where women's power and impact in their community is still, I would think, growing. So that we've seen the impact the women have and how they can and help to bring forward better futures, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think just the more we empower ourselves and the women around us, the more rapidly that growth will become exponential. Can I ask a question? Can I? Yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, as in, you, when your talk was quite, quite short, obviously, we have a lot of time, but um, you didn't mention education in, oh. in, in that. But what does Christian Aid sort of view on sort of education empowerment of women um, in the developing world in particular? Is, is that positive? Is that a part of the answer? Or, oh uh, no, it definitely isn't yeah. part of the answer. And we're not particularly, we don't focus on education ourselves as